Welcome to the Startup Grind. We always like to get started with just your background. Tell us about your upbringing. Was entrepreneurship part of your family? What did your parents do? You know, what was early life like? Early life like for you? Uh, so, entrepreneur and like what I want to do with my life. My dad was a great engineer, a truly incredible engineer scientist. And when I was about 17, I was sitting at dinner with him. He had been part of a young company, the engineering side of a company that might have changed the world. It didn't. It was crushed by Sony, uh, a, a joint venture, actually. My gosh, Mr. Olson, how are you? <laughs> um, uh, whatever. And at one night at dinner, he said to me, there are a lot of remarkable engineers in the world and a lot of remarkable products and technologies and things like that, but not enough people to help turn those into real businesses and companies. And I just thought, that that's what I want to try and do, and, and literally went to college thinking that when I got out of college, tried to get a job, because what does business mean when you're in college? Like, literally, you don't even know. You've had a, a job before in your life, but business, what does that mean? So I tried to get a job that would give me an overview of business. And uh, what was that job? I was working for a group called the Boston Consulting Group. Okay. <laughs> and uh, about six years out of college, I was sitting in a, a multi-billion dollar company in the boardroom, where no one who's six months out of college has any business being really. Um, but I was sitting there, I'd been the researcher on this big project. They were worried for the future of their company, deeply worried. Um, there's this huge argument that erupts in the room, and I've been up for nights and sweating bullets and shaking about uh, what was going to happen. And in the middle of the most violent argument, I'd never seen people argue this violently even in my home, much less in a corporate <laughs> board. And uh, the chairman of the board turns to me and says, Tom, what do you think? And it was stressful and exciting and whatever. And I knew, yeah, I could, I, I could like this business. <laughs> if this is as bad as it gets in some sense, I could like it. So, okay, so that was me. And, and uh, just started, kept focusing on how, how do you how do you be the business side, quote unquote, of technology enabled companies? Okay. Awesome. So have you figured it out? No. I think you have. I mean, well, you have an impressive track record. So. Well, you'll spend the rest of your life. We all will spend the rest of our lives figuring out how to do some of those things. But I love what I do. Love what I do and love what I've had the opportunity to do. And I've been involved with some great companies and people and technologies. Awesome. I so background, you were asking a little bit. I, after I got out of school, um, uh, I actually, while I was in school, I tried to start a company um, uh, around a high-speed video duplication technology that in the day, if you guys can take yourselves back that long ago, the, no, the Blockbuster and other video rental places were everywhere. It was a dominant um, media at the time, but you would go, on the night a new movie would come out, and it was hard to get the movie you wanted. They would have 40 copies or 50 copies of the latest release. Well, that was not even nearly enough. So you'd walk in, and the movie you wanted wasn't there unless you figured out how to get out of work at noon and run in there. Um, so the concept at the time was, well, do high-speed video duplication and turn all the inventory into flexible inventory. So I can have 800 copies of the new release on the night it comes out, and the next night, 600 copies and on down until it, you only need three. It was a good idea. It was in the interests of all the parties involved. Movie companies were really frustrated that they could only sell 40 copies of the latest thing to go on video, that they weren't getting any incremental revenue after they had sold that, so they really wanted a new system in line with much of what's wound up happening with iTunes and things like that. The truth of the matter, it was a great concept, a great technology, a great market. People wouldn't invest in me. I hadn't done it before. I was this young guy in graduate school, and they didn't say that to my face. They would say, oh, there's a sensor there. But it, that was it. Then a company called uh, Sonic Innovations, which was a digital signal processing hearing device here in Utah. 
Um, and that wound up, it, digital signal processing hearing aid is a small segment, but it made a big difference for a lot of people and it wound up being the fastest growing hearing device company up to that moment in time and became a publicly traded company and all. Uh, but then the internet came along. Mm -hmm. And uh, some friends of mine whom I worked with at BCG uh, called and said, you know, we're doing this thing, it's called City Search. And why should there be a Yellow Pages anymore? Why should there be local newspapers? We're going to put that, that all online and uh, change the face of, of the world through the internet. That sounded interesting to me. I did not want to spend the rest of my career in hearing devices. Um, uh, so we started that with great big ideas. We raised a lot of money with a lot of enthusiasm from a lot of remarkable people. And we could not figure out how to make the thing profitable. And out of desperation, um, uh, we, the senior executive team, said, well, um, a lot of the people that we're catering to um, are doing a variety of things. There are these online uh, categories that are starting to emerge. We think we ought to get into the online personal space. We buy this company called Match.com, which has a great brand name, but no technology. And this other company called One and Only, which has a great technology, but not such a good brand name. So we bought those, put them together, started running online personals, match.com. We still couldn't convince anyone that that was valuable. We'd go talk with potential investors and they'd, they'd roll their eyes and they'd say, all of personals in the whole US, if you like, pick out of every newspaper in the country, how many personals are there, how much gets paid for those, the whole market is $100 million. What fraction of that do you think you're going to be able to capture? 10%? We said, no, 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 you, you don't get it. Online, personals is a better business. We think we're gonna be bigger than 100 million all by ourselves. And they would chuckle. You're so naive. Well, of course, today, match all by itself was half a billion dollars in revenue. Um, and then we convinced a guy, Barry Diller, that we could sell some tickets online. And we convinced them that they were selling about $200,000 a month for the tickets online. Um, we convinced them that if we could get it to $2 million a month online, tenfold increase in two years, we'd blend this company Ticketmaster with the company City Search and Match and do that. Well, and I got to go run the ticketing business. So I had that 10x increase job. And 18 months later, we were selling $100 million worth of tickets a month online. And combined that company, you know, it was right place, right time, lots of good things. Uh, and then uh, in 2001, got to come here and run the Ancestry, which was an ama is an amazing business. Uh, an underrun business, but it's an incredible, incredible business. Uh, and uh, now I'm getting to run another great company that no one will have heard of yet, but someday I'm hopefully we will have called Expertisity. Okay, awesome. So let's let's go back and kind of go through each of these stages yep. of your life a little bit. Yeah. So let's go to Sonic. Yep. So in college, you tried to start a venture, wasn't successful. So how did you turn that around and all of a sudden start something successful? How did you deal with the failure of before and come back and come back with this this yep. success? No magic. You it, you know. Every, I think if you're really leading an organization, even if it's an organization of one to start with. Every day is about a lot of failure. It's things didn't go quite like you hoped or they you planned they would. They never do. Do you learn from that in ways that are credible and realistic, and you do things a little bit differently next? Um, with Sonic Innovation, it was uh, I, I recognized a little bit more how important it was to get some other people who were really credible involved as early as possible, um, and uh, that helps. People weren't investing in me and Sonic, and in fact, eventually the board at Sonic said to me, we're gonna hire this guy who's been in the hearing business for 15 years, you've been great as the founder president, but you're not gonna be the CEO of this guy. Is. That was part of what made me say, well, fine, I'm ready to go do another thing. Uh, but credible people is really what made Sonic Innovation something people could invest in. We raised $6 million-ish before 
that was kind of it. And I act as if that's some one magic ingredient. It isn't. You know, there are always some set of things, and and um, I think entrepreneurship for the purpose of this gathering is always this balance between hearing what the world is telling you, the data is telling you, humans are telling you, the market is telling you, customers are telling you about why what you're doing isn't good enough or doesn't work. Balance that with kind of this, you don't know what you're talking about, attitude, a little bit. And you've got, I mean, the nature of doing something that hasn't been done before, if everyone thought it could be done, it would have already been done, right? You're doing something that by definition, most people around you will tell you, well, that's maybe not such a good idea, that can't be done. So how do you strike that balance between the, I hear you, that's a good point, I should change what I'm doing a little bit, and you may think this is wrong, but you know what, I'm betting against you. I, I'm working on it because I believe in it, and it's okay if you don't. Okay. So how did Sonic kick it start? So you have to come from a, a business background. Did you have a co-founder, um, the technology that you based this business around? Really? So um, my dad, who was in, this incredible engineer, uh, knew that I was looking for a company to, to found, a technology that was viable and credible. And it was actually a technology that came out of BYU. Um, uh, Doug Shabrias and Richard Christiansen. Uh, I don't know if Doug's still there, but he might be. In any case, they had been working on a model for hearing for a while. And they hired my dad, actually a, a, someone who was going to maybe invest, hired my dad to evaluate the technology. My dad came home from this evaluatory thing and said, these guys really need help. They, they want to turn this into a business. They need someone. You should at least go talk to them. And so that's how it started. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you convince them that you had what it takes to help them get money? Uh, that is really good, and I don't think I really did. They were nice enough to humor me. Uh -huh. uh, I just took it on me to took it on myself to write a business plan. Uh, I called Carver Mead, who was a incredibly um, well respected. CMOS engineer, um, really the father of CMOS design. And he thought it was my dad calling because we have the same name. So he took my call. He would not have taken my call. He would have told me <laughs> if he hadn't thought it were my dad, but it was my dad. Uh, and he says, that sounds interesting. So he started to get involved. So it was just kind of this building of credibility. And uh, at some level, that's, again, that's always what leadership is. You don't have an innate right to be the sole leader of some place in perpetuity. Unless maybe it's a hot dog stand and you're the only employee and you do own it all. That You can decide then. But as soon as you have employees and people who are relying on you and shareholders and all those kinds of things, you're playing this balancing act among all these people helping them understand what an opportunity is that they won't see frequently. They don't get it either yet. Therefore, they'll say, well, I don't know if I'm willing to follow you there. Um, and, uh, and yet, bringing them along and getting them to say, I believe in you, yeah, you can keep having that role. Even if you don't have the role, are they saying, I will follow you. Yeah, I'll do what you say even if I don't believe it 100%. So. Okay, so how do you get that done? What's the, so the beginnings of Sonic, you had you know a few people, yeah. and how do you convince them in those early stages to follow you? How do you get those first few people on board? Like, what is, what is it that you have to do to prove it? I think a lot of us as entrepreneurs have valid ideas, like you said, even in college, you yeah. have a great one. How, what's, what do we have to do to get that first ounce of credibility? That is a good question. Um, you have to have, so, the, Maybe the most fundamental job, again, of a leader is that how do you convince anyone to come work for you or to invest in you, which coming to work for you really is at some level, um, uh, to do what you ask. And it isn't unique to a startup. If you're, it, 
today. I'm talking with people whose first reaction to coming to work for Experticity would be, I've never even heard of Experticity. I'm, I am a senior executive in a multi-hundred million dollar company. Why would I even come work for you? And so I'm still in this mode all day, every day. Uh, let me help you understand what this could be in a way that would make you take a risk. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. And if no one will take a risk with you, you ought to take that to heart. Um, uh, it's really all from day one, it's about convincing someone, an investor, a potential partner, a coworker, this is worth investing in. So that part never changes. Day one to, to and I think it's one thing you get, you work on honing your skills around forever. Who do you want to have a best in? That's as big a deal and as big a question. It's like, okay, you start out a lot of time when you're a young entrepreneur, you're like, money. I just need money, right? Mm -hmm. I'll, anyone who's an investor, I'll take their money. And pretty soon you realize, oh my gosh, it, it is not all created equal. There are some people whose money you don't want and some other people who would help you, not just with that, they'll help you with lots of things that will be the assets you need to build something real. Mm -hmm. So was that a hard lesson to learn for you? Did you take some money that you, that you didn't want initially with Sonic? I'm, some I'm still learning that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, sure, but you can't, nothing, you know, no person and no money is perfect. Everyone comes with pluses and minuses. So, you know, you, you hire someone and they remain with you. Um, you would hope for as long as in the balance, they've got a lot more good than bad, but every one has good and bad. And similarly with money, and you learn what, um, what, what you work well with, what works well with you, those kinds of things, and again, keep learning that always. But of course, I've learned lots of hard lessons. Again, you know, back to that point about the, you're fundamentally disagreeing with people when you're creating something new. Most of the people around you when you're creating something new, most, not a few, most of them, at some level, think you're kind of messed up for, for trying this. Even if they say, wow, that's a really good idea, probably if they're saying it's a really great idea, that's a cool idea, and that's all they're saying, they don't understand enough to know the problems with it. The people who could be honest with you about what the problems are with it, they're willing to give you the benefit of the doubt at some level. You have to convince them that. And yet you're arguing with them. They, they, part, a healthy part of them says, that's going to be really hard. I don't know if you can pull that off. So that fundamental tension is maybe one of the most fundamental tension, fundamental things about being an entrepreneur. Building some functional organization that didn't exist before. Now is that tension something you enjoy or is it something you dread as you go through it? Love it. That's when I knew that I was... Does it go back to that boardroom scene where people yeah. are young it's kind of that? Not, maybe not quite to there, but yeah, that first time that you realize that you go to bed and, and life was really, really hard. You had to fire someone you really liked. You, had, you realized that a fundamental thing you were counting on just does not work and all these plans you had have gone awry or whatever it is. And then you wake up the next morning and say, okay, that's... Let's take on some more of that. Let's do that again. <laughs> if that's kind of the way it is, then maybe you're cut out for it. If you wake up the next morning in misery, then probably entrepreneurial, you should probably go do something safer. Okay. Yeah. So that's good to know. Okay, so after Sonic, you're at City Search. Yeah. Um, so you, obviously, you talked about a big pivot moving towards Match.com. So what was that? Obviously, you had a lot of investor money. Yeah. Um, was that hard to do to like step away and say, I mean, do you consider it a failure, or did you see it having a lot of success? How do you view it in your mind? That, uh, um, so at, at the level of, uh, was it a good business? It was a failure. I mean, we, we got a lot of people to give us 
money for city search and city search didn't pan out we were we hired 80 people we built an office of 80 people here in salt lake um, to go build this next generation media company uh, and in the end we could afford about two and today city search i don't think has a single employee here we got those investors a great return for their money. Ticketmaster City Search was a massive success for people, but it was because of Match.com and it was because of Ticketmaster. It wasn't because of City Search. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, as a business, in front, as an investment, the whole thing, what we created, was a great thing. Yeah. I, uh, you know, does it reinforce this message that? You should never do anything unless you have a plan for how it will succeed. Um, and yet, things never go quite according to plan. How good are you at when they didn't go like you thought they would, bouncing off and redirecting and going down the next path? That, in the end, that's what determines every great company. Um, I was somewhere recently and someone was making a big deal about what a great idea Facebook was and they thought they had an idea as good as Facebook but they were terrified to share it um, and I, I had to say in the conversation it's not about the idea there were dozens of things that were Facebook and ideas like that and hundreds or thousands of people who had the idea that is online community, blah, 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 blah. A lot of those companies existed when Facebook existed in its earliest day. MySpace and uh, uh, GeoCities and blah, 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 all those things. It's mostly about tomorrow morning when something doesn't go like you thought it would go, are you better at adjusting and coming up with a better next step than the rest of the people around you? And over an extended period of time, Facebook has been better at that than a lot of other people. But the people who think that the idea that was the start of Facebook is somehow uniquely valuable are totally kidding themselves. OK. So so after City Search and Ticketmaster, you went to Ancestry. Yep. Um, in 2001, obviously not the company it is today. Yep. Um, is that a job you sought out? Did they come after you? How did that all, how did that relationship work? So that guy right over there was, uh, they, they, Ancestry had in 2000 roughly raised about $25 million at a $275 million pre-money valuation. So $300 million post-money valuation. And then the bubble burst. And Paul at Spring had been part of an investment of $15 million at a $20 million pre. So they've gone from 300 million post to $20 million pre, a huge cram down. And these guys had invested during the process of considering that investment and those kinds of things. And Paul had called me because we were running Match.com. And the only real asset inside what was then called my family was this ancestry subscription business. And they wanted to know, you know, are we thinking about the right things in this subscription business? So they talked with me, and, and uh, as the investment closed, um, uh, I had reasons. My dad was getting close to the end of his life here in Utah. And, and they had reasons to want maybe some new leadership, and suddenly I was being asked to come and run Ancestry, which was great. But let's be honest, Tom said no twice. <laughs> <laughs> Came back third time begging, and something happened in his life where he said yes. <laughs> and it was an incredible, incredible experience. Truly an incredible experience. It's still one of the, one of the great companies anywhere. There just aren't that many companies that, that are a good business. They make more money then they spend, and they have growth potential and so on. That company creates cash like you can't believe. Um, it does a good thing for the world. You know, fundamentally, like, could I be, part of what was hard for me at Ticketmaster was, was getting the service fee on tickets. No one likes you. No one likes you. <laughs> it may be a fine thing, but nobody likes you. Um, uh, whereas in Ancestry, everybody likes you. It's like, oh, you got me to discover my grandmother. And, you know, it's just everybody loves you. Um, and uh, it's a great business. So, okay. Let's talk about that transition. So you came in, obviously, 
my family at the time had done, yeah. had done a lot of work and there was obviously a team set in place. So yeah. how was that transition coming in as a new CEO to fill that role? Was it difficult to kind of mesh with this new team or did they like, welcome you with open arms? How was that? Of course there's a mix. Of course there's a mix. Um, they had a better team in place than the business was showing because they had had this period of time when lots of people and lots of credible people thought it was going to be giant. It was going to be an overnight internet bubble before people acknowledged it was a bubble. It was going to be one of these huge start tomorrow at a dollar, it'll be a hundred by Thursday kind of thing. So they've been able to attract good talent. Um, some people needed to go. Some people were, were already kind of, I'm not interested in this new smaller version under this guy Tom. So some people left, that's fine. Some people were, I'll give them a minute and see, and some people, I wasn't gonna give them very long. You know, just the nature of things. So there was a mix, um, but uh, all in all, I think the transition went pretty well. We started having a lot of success pretty soon. So the, kind of at the time, the business was on a run rate to do about $25 million for the year. Um, so two million a month, month-ish. And it was losing a little bit of money. Uh, and aspirations were pretty low. Relatively low valuation, money in. Gosh, all we have to do is get this thing to profitable. Well, by a year later, the trajectory was already significantly better than anyone had thought it might be. Um, that buys you a lot of ability to do a lot of things, whether it's people or assets and those kinds of things. So and pretty soon, you know, it was doing very, very well. We were doing, we were, you know, closer to $10 million a month more than that and generating you know, $3 million a month more than $3 million a month in cash. Mm -hmm. You know, profits cash. You just get to say, okay, every month. So. That, that, that's a good business. Yeah, that's a good business. <laughs> so, is it easier to be a CEO when it's struggling or when it's that successful? I mean, how do the problems differ between those? I mean, obviously, you're at Ancestry when it's kind of a pullback and then yeah, you're successful again. How does that match up? Is it easier when there's lots of cash or does that create a whole bunch of new problems for you? No, no, cash is good. <laughs> <laughs> cash gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, uh, but being a CEO is always hard. Again, go back to this theme. If you're building a business, uh, whether the world around you recognizes it or not, what you're really doing is you're solving problems. Problems is half of that phrase. You're all day, every day, as the head of a company, you're taking on a lot of problems. And, and either that's fine and energizing and, and you kind of get through it to the next thing and you say, okay, problem solved. We've got a new person in that role. We've got capital we need it. We've got uh, uh, whatever it is. Um, a client that was unhappy that's now happy. All those kinds of things. Or you're not actually building something. You can kid yourself that you're not, but a CEO who's happy because his company is quote unquote successful, well, why isn't it more successful? You're doing it that well, why aren't you doing it more? Um, uh, if you're unsuccessful, uh, that is a problem. But is success, I mean, success is more about trajectory a lot of the time than it is about cash to the bottom line or absolute scale or those kinds of things. So. Okay. All right, so we want to give the audience some time to answer questions, but yeah. to ask questions. But before we do that, we want to talk about experticity a little bit. So you said, none of us have probably heard of it, so now's your chance. What is experticity? So, uh, experticity is about putting helpful expertise back into retail commerce. Mm -hmm. For the last 30 years, the dominant theme in commerce has been low prices, selection, and self-service. Almost every major retail concept we know of today, whether it's Walmart, or big box stores, or um, even phrases that we all now take for granted, like buying in bulk, they've all been a part of this 
push toward those themes in retail. And the effect of those themes in retail has been to squeeze out, to marginalize anyone who actually knows what they're talking about. <clears throat> Think of Home Depot a decade or more ago. You would go in, and the person who you could find in the plumbing aisle, you'd walk into the plumbing aisle, more plumbing stuff than you'd ever seen in your life, and you could reach it all. No one had to step up and get it for you. And if you had a problem, you said, you know, I've got this rusted thing. And some guy who had spent most of his career as a plumber would tell you, oh, have you thought about taking, have you thought about whether the part that you just took this off is actually rusted through two? You're going to need to replace that with this, blah, blah, blah. Here's what you need to solve your problem. How do we get it? Well, you know, five years ago, if you walked into Home Depot, you couldn't even find a person. And if you could, they had an orange smock on, but you'd ask them something and they'd kind of say, oh, let me get someone who might help you and that person never showed up. Um, at the same time, information became nearly infinite. So, you know, 30 years ago, if you wanted to know about the plumbing stuff, the place to go find it out was at the store. Now, all of us turn first thing to the internet. Of course. There's so much information there. But it's to a point where I, it's useless. I can't, I, I, a review on Yelp that says better than Olive Garden does not help me. <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, <laughs> so what we're doing at Experticity is identifying the people who have meaningful expertise in a given product category. We're making them into better experts, we're rewarding them for their expertise, we're giving them the incentives to become better experts, and then we connect them with the product companies who want them speaking on their behalves, with the retailers who want to tap into them. Um, and eventually with the consumers who want to seek out advice. Help me, I've got to buy a barbecue tomorrow. Help me find someone who actually knows whether it's, you know, I should buy that one or this one. Why the $400 difference? Is it worthwhile? So we're going to put that helpful expertise back into retail commerce. Okay. So what's the biggest problem you guys face right now? What's your biggest problem as the CEO of Expertise Almost always my biggest problem is how to get great people who can help me solve more problems more quickly. Uh, you know, that, that is so multifaceted, but that's really it. It's, it's speed of solving problems and again, getting back to that notion that every day you figure out something that didn't go like you planned. So how do you bounce off that obstacle, redirect in an intelligent way, and keep going fast. Mm -hmm. So and you need a people and a culture and all those things to do that. Okay. Um, so one last question. You've been with all these successful companies in Utah. Um, do you see Utah as a good place to do business? Has it been beneficial to you? Do you wish you were you know, in Silicon Valley where there's you know, you know, more DCs? Or? I, there are lots of great places in the world. Silicon Valley is an amazing place. So it's an amazing place. Austin's an amazing place. Boston's an amazing place. I love it here. I love Utah. Um, it's an amazing place. And you know, building a great company isn't about geography, really. It's uh, uh, maybe there are places that aren't good to build a company, but I haven't found them. I mean, you know, uh, Warren Buffett built a great company in Nebraska. You know, this is a exceptional place. And when I'm trying to recruit someone here, I talk about, look, it's an unbelievably entrepreneurial place by definition. You don't have any anchor tenants. There's no Intel or Boeing or you know something like that here to be the giant company. Adobe is starting to be as close to something like that as we have. But in the balance per capita, we have more small businesses than any other place in the country. So very entrepreneurial. People building real companies interesting companies. As close to instant access to the out of doors and kind of that life balance thing that we all crave when we're working hard on building things. And a real airport. You can go how many times a day to the Bay Area, how many times a day to New York, directly to Paris. Um, that's just a rare set of ingredients coming together. So I love it. Okay, awesome. It's okay if we yeah. go to the audience? Of course. So we're still in the room, so if you have questions, just raise your hand. As you still come, we, what about the business model and how flexible we were to figure out the right business model 
and knowing that it was working, there was a trend, it was successful, and changing it. How was that process? And who were the people on like milestones? Yeah. So Ancestry at the time, it felt to me like there were a couple of levers, right? It was selling, it was already selling a subscription to some data sets. Um, uh, what wasn't perfectly, these two levers, one was would people pay more, would, could you upsell people? You know, this notion, you have a customer, they're your best candidate to pay you more. Well, in a subscription business, it's not obvious that's an opportunity. Most subscription businesses kind of focus on same price, maybe a little price increase, but same product next year. We had an opportunity, and we didn't know how big it was, but we had an opportunity to say, no, there are other things. And for people who are deeply into this genealogical quest, people who would happily pay more for additional products, let's see how much leverage can come out of that. How much can we grow our average recurring revenue per customer? And then, of course, how many customers could we have? And always for Ancestry, the knock was, it still is today. The reason it just went private again, by the way, is because it's never figured out how to solve this next problem, which is how big could the world of genealogy possibly be? The whole world, everyone, every employee who's gone to work there, every investor says, how big can this be? We don't know, because they're pioneering the market, and it doesn't feel like it's that big. And every time they exceed their revenue targets or their member targets, the market says, that is amazing. How would you guys do that again? Well, now you're that much closer to the end of your runway. And so people never give them the benefit of the doubt. But we did a lot to make it, uh, we grew our, our member base a lot more quickly than people thought we could, just by starting to um, be more and more disciplined about how we did online marketing. We had some great people working with us at the time who were good at that. Craig Sherman and folks in his team that were just good. And it was the early days of doing keyword buys, things like that. And we had enough good people to just start taking advantage of that kind of stuff really quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Have you brought somebody in that you really had high hopes in a key position and then been disappointed by them? Sure. And how did that, how did you handle that? Get rid of them as fast as you can. Really, um, it's on you to figure out how to define the job. It's on you to figure out, which is really hard, by the way. It, it, it's a skill that, again, I think I'll develop forever. Every one of us will develop forever. What are those insights about? What do I really want this person to be doing? How will I know whether they were successful a year from now or not? Um, those kinds of things. And then you work on interviewing and figuring out is this person capable of achieving those things by their background, their enthusiasm, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, those types of things. Even the very best people I know, really exceptional, that kind of stuff. If you're really right more than four out of five times, you know, the very best is kind of four out of five times. So one in five times. Like, that just didn't work. That person wasn't what I thought they were. They weren't motivated by the things I thought they would be. They weren't capable in the way I thought they were based on what, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and the sooner, if you can be clear with them and yourself about what you thought they were going to achieve and how, it's easy to have a conversation that says, not painless, but easy, that says, you came here to do this. You're not doing that. This isn't working. Let's part ways. Sooner rather than later. So as a serial entrepreneur, I'm interested in your thoughts, uh, kind of along the lines of Elon Musk of talking about doing some, some good things, but then going on to doing more important things. It sounds like experticity is one of those things, like actually doing something that's useful in the market, but also important and uh, worth doing in yeah. uh, this kind of social entrepreneurship yeah. movement. Yeah. Um, I love the social entrepreneurship movement, whether you think about it as like, hey, this company is doing something that should be done for the world, an environmental thing, a green thing, whatever those kind of things. Or kind of coming out from the other side, by the way, the, the whole not-for-profit world starting to think of itself much more as 
you still have to run something sustainable. You can pretend that you're not selling something, but you're pretending. You're convincing someone to give you the money to go do what you're doing based on your mission. Your product is your mission at that point, your ability to package and convey it. Um, and I think a lot of good stuff is happening now and is going to happen over the next several years. I remember in graduating from college, a really hot debate among some really smart people in the Wall Street Journal, on Wall Street, all these things. It is a, does a business have any social responsibility or is it purely about profit? You still hear some bits of that today. Um, uh, so much less of that today. Almost everyone much more generally has a sensibility about you don't, there is no business without profit. Meaning you have to have more, yet more has to come in, even if it's not for profit, then goes out, or you cease to exist at some point. Um, but it's about so much more than that. And people are going to start to understand that in deeper and deeper and deeper ways. You know, whether it's the quality of people, or that you're doing something good for the world, or whatever it is. Yeah, Elon is a, Elon is a great um, mouthpiece for that. He's a great mouthpiece for that. One of his first companies, we came this close, we came literally hours from merging with Zip2, City Search and Zip2, before we went off and did Match. It was one of the things that forced us into the desperation of, holy cow, we gotta go do something, because that didn't go through. And then he went and did PayPal or whatever. But, <laughs> uh, he's a great mouth, he's an inspirational mouthpiece, right? But uh, uh, I think all of, you, you can take these principles of doing good in a way that brings in more than goes out in a sustainable way, and you can apply that to doing service in you know, uh, Nicaragua, or you can apply that to can we build this cleaner energy source? Um, and it is nice to work for a business that you feel like it's doing a good thing for the world. You feel like it values its employees. You feel like it cares about its customers even after it sold its product. You feel like you know those kinds of things do seem to become more and more important. Uh, is that a focus yeah. expertise? Is that one of the reasons you're doing that right now? Yeah. Yeah. I, it becomes clearer and clearer to me over time that, that the things you manage around have to be that kind of multifaceted. And whether it's expertise or not, this notion that for the last 30 years in retail, it's been all about low prices and all of the quality people have gotten squished out of retail, it's just a great example to me of like people who got too narrowly focused around too narrow a set of KPIs and missed the key driver uh, of, of some of their longer term success. Jim Collins, you know, get the right people on the bus. Well, all of retail seems to have missed that point of advice. Got really wrong people on the bus in most stores I go into, but anyway. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I've really enjoyed it tonight. I, I have to let you know, first of all, I have heard of Expertisity. Um, I'm actually a client on the 3.5 side. Great. Um, enjoying it. We're, we're pretty new with it still. It's been about four or five Who are you months. with? I work for a rifle manufacturer called Desert Tactical Arms. Yeah, sure. Um, you guys are right down here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, we've hung out with the team a couple yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. You went up to Alaska. Alaska. Too. Didn't you go up to yeah, Alaska? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, all right. That's <laughs> great. With Mac, yeah. Yeah. Um, so my question is, you've, you've uh, kind of shared a little slice of your life with um, some exciting chapters, the founding side of things, um, also the managing, operating side of things, and kind yeah. of wearing different hats. Do you feel yourself pulled more towards one or missing one um, when you are just deep in the trenches of operating? Are you like being pulled away towards chasing a new idea or when you're you know, working on getting profitable and, and turning the flywheel that first time? Are you kind of wishing that, um, how, how, is, how does your heart beat over the... Over yeah. the course of time. I, I, different people certainly are different. There are certain people, when I was young, a long time ago, no, when I was young, I, I thought that what I loved was more of the entrepreneurial, the startup, the young, the nimble, the whatever. Um, and what I realized actually with Ticketmaster, what I loved was growth. 
Um, growth makes things new and different and interesting and challenging. And growth becomes, to keep growing on a bigger and bigger and bigger base becomes a lot more complicated over time. I love that. To get it requires this delicate focus balance. How do you do enough new stuff every day as a company in our organization and yet not cause mass confusion or lack of focus? That's, again, something I expect I'll learn in my whole career. It's a really delicate balance. How do you just stay just at the edge of everyone kind of feeling like, oh my gosh, we've got to do a lot tomorrow, but knowing what they've got to do tomorrow and not feeling like you know, giving up. And I know tons of entrepreneurs who are really bad at that. Like they're idea, 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 idea. And every time things get hard, which they always do, again, things don't go like you would plan, they kind of think, well, I got too hard. I'll go do another thing. And guess what? Those people never wind up actually building something. They wind up as the seed of something. So they're affiliated with something that later went on to be successful. Um, but I think you have to have that kind of balance. And there is no magic answer. It's that constant. How much is too much newness, innovation, new ideas? Let's try things differently balanced with not abandoning things because they got tough and just moving on and sowing confusion into your organization and those kinds of things. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. With the success of Yelp and Angie's List now, do you feel that City Search was before its time? And related to that, how do you as an entrepreneur know if your idea is before its time? Yeah. That's, a, that's really interesting. Um, we tried Groupon, we tried Yelp, we tried Angie's List, we tried other, several other things that the idea and the operations and the substance have wound on, uh, up being really big for periods of time successes. And so yes, at some level we were before time, before our time. That doesn't excuse the fact though that we way over-invested in what we could actually achieve. Meaning 80 people to run this office in Salt Lake to go out and sell two sites per day, per salesperson, with all this support. That just, that, that was putting the cart before the horse too much. And I do see a lot of businesses, and we were guilty of it, doing that. They, they go and they invest all this money in this big team for goals that they can't and they wind up not achieving. You have to strike, I, I think we would have been, if we had been smarter and more methodical on the one hand, we would have been all those things. We literally implemented Groupon. We literally implemented Yelp. We had reviews and a best of restaurant guide and all those kinds of things. We literally implemented Angie's List, Box Service Master. You know, all, all these things that were out there and yet we kind of, we, we just, we believe so much that we were going to be successful that we weren't as practical as we needed to be about what was going to happen next. Now fortunately, we had Ticketmaster. Our plan was to get to 10 times bigger in two years, seemed so aggressive, blah, blah, blah. Well, worked out a lot better than that. <laughs> so fortunately there were enough things going on that we had those counterbalancing things. Um, before, you know, kind of success before your time, I think winds up being kind of a cop-out in some sense. How do you figure out how to remove the obstacles and get enough momentum in a good way? And it's, of course, partly getting lucky some of the time. I think a great example is Groupon, right? Uh, Groupon was the fastest growing company ever for an instant. And it's kind of a disaster right now. Um, but if you talked with people during a certain, you know, six month people, those were the geniuses of the planet. Uh, and yet I did, I mean, I could have told you that was a house of cards that was going to come down. Because I've lived it already. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, can you share with us um, some of the 
the fun aha moments along the journey as an entrepreneur. Um, I think back to the one that you shared with me many years ago of the, the moment that the algorithms worked for the hearing aid. Could you kind of give us some, these are these, these, are these paydays you have them on the road. Yeah. Can you share a few of those with us or, or, or maybe that one, some, some of the details of that? Yeah. You know, I, uh, let me build on that a little bit. There are those all the time. Like, again, you never do anything that you don't plan to have be successful. And you have some of these moments and times. So contrast, my very first on, day on the job with Ticketmaster, literally my first day on the job, I've been told, I'm going to go run this thing. The guy whose job it has been to run it has been told, like, less than 48 hours before, He's not going to be running it. I'm going to be running it. He's spent his whole career at Ticketmaster. I'm this kid. I know nothing. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Whatever. I get up at 4 in the morning to go into the main operating center of, of Ticketmaster's sales organization arm. And it's a Backstreet Boys, which at one time was very, very big, on <laughs> sale at uh, 10 in the morning East Coast time. And we're going to open up hundreds of thousands of outlets and those kinds of things. And uh, uh, the 10 o'clock hour hits, all of Ticketmaster systems come on. So at the time, it's outlets where you're standing in line at the grocery store, phone centers across the country, and the internet. Well, it comes online, and I'm like, this is my new job. What's going to happen? And literally, the thing melts down. <laughs> totally. Not a single ticket is getting sold on the internet. <laughs> And I'm just sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be painful. What have I just signed up for? Contrast that with like two months later, we had hired this person to come in and do this network stuff. And, and we're, we're aspiring to do more than a million dollars in sales on the internet in one day, which will wind up being an hour really, because all the main ticket sales for a big concert on sale happened right away. Well, we did, we did a lot more than that in a very short period of time. It was just this feeling of total satisfying elation. Millions of dollars. I'm literally, you know the ad, you guys may have seen the ad on TV where they turn on their internet site, there's an order, and there's another order, and they're all high-fiving, and then all of a sudden the thing starts going, <laughs> and they all get this blank look on their face because they have no idea how they're going to fulfill all these orders. Ours was just pure elation. Order, 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 with a little bit, more than $10 million of revenue later on. I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh! Uh, so cool. Um, being an entrepreneur, and, back, and to that comment, like this more fundamental thing, you need those wins along the way. Like you can, you can set up something as a goal. I, I hope to build this company in years, or I hope to launch this technology, or I hope to whatever. You need wins along the way. You need them for your own energy. Your team needs them. And so you hope you get them. And they do wind up being these triumphant moments. It might be a, a person that you see wind up being really successful, some contract that you thought you would get. But closing around funding, you, you know, and yet you need to recognize that none of those things in and of itself is an endpoint. Too many people treat, especially funding events, I find, but like launches of products. I know lots of people who've gotten hung up on, we're going to launch this product, and they forget, well, then the next day you actually got to sell it. So you can celebrate the launch all you want. But no one buys it the next day. Why were you celebrating? You worked hard to get there, so celebrate the launch, but don't let people think that's the end point. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. So yes, this man in the front row. Yes. <laughs> so my question is, uh, how is it that you develop a criteria for uh, really evaluating if something is worth doing? Because I I have undertaken a number of projects that, you know, my most recent one, I've really been stepping back and evaluating and saying. I'm not really sure that it, the pain that is solved is valuable pain to solve. Mm -hmm. And so now I, I look at other things that cross my mind as opportunities to kind of look into. Yeah. But I, I'm now getting the sense of, you know, how do I actually quantify 
what value there is in solving the problem, yeah. not just this was an interesting technical problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, look, the end of the day, will people pay you is a really good criteria. <laughs> it really is. And I don't care whether it's for not-for-profit or for a, it, it, it's whatever. Will people pay you for it? Um, uh, there are other reasons, of course, too, um, that you put in the balance. Will people pay for it, you for it and you believe in it and it's rewarding and you think it does a good thing and all those kinds of things. But if people won't pay you for it, it's not worth doing. And then how, how long does it take you to get to that? Sonic Innovations, we had to spend money for years before we had a single thing to sell to anyone. I never, ever want to do that again. Ever. <laughs> Someone's got to do it, and I get drug development, and I get massive manufacturing undertakings and all those kinds of things, but it's awful. Compared to building something today and seeing if someone will sell it, to, you know, buy it tomorrow, and then one more step, and one more step, and one more step. I'd much prefer that. But And part of a good business, part of any good business is and a good entrepreneur is kind of having a sense for what assets do you have to line up in order to get to that sustainable point in time. Part of a bad entrepreneur is they don't. Uh, an unsuccessful entrepreneur, and you may only be unsuccessful for a certain period of time, but you think you have it all lined up and one day you find out you do not have enough money. You know, it may only be your wife you have to go tell, no, we're really in trouble. Or it may be hundreds of employees, no, we're really in trouble. I don't have a paycheck for you anymore. Um, okay, let's give that a talk.